attention, please. I'd like to welcome you all to our third annual forum. Welcome you on behalf of the 21st Century Fund. My name is Barbara Kelman. And before I turn the evening over to our moderator, I just wanted to let you know that we don't have to feel too badly as though struggling with this issue is a, is a problem just of our generation. Uh, apparently, Benjamin Franklin, um, uh, well, after he had written his own book of devotions, he wrote a book of virtues. He made it himself, he put the paper together, he sewed it together, and he ruled each page with red ink to have seven columns for each day of the week and marked it so that he could keep track. He counted 13 virtues, temperance, silence, order, resolution, fragility, industry, sincerity, and so on. Um, every week he marked his faults. And at the end of the week, he tried to erase them. Soon, the Book of Virtues was a mess. <clears throat> My little book, he said, which by scraping out the marks on the paper of old faults to make room for the new ones in a new course, became full of holes. In the end, he gave up, and that was his point. No life is without blemish, and after all, a benevolent man should allow a few faults in himself to keep his friends in countenance. <laughs> um, welcome, and I'm going to give you Carrie Goldberg of WBUR, and also a Brookline mom, who's uh, agreed to be our moderator for the evening. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I am so glad to be moderating tonight's panel, titled Imperfection, and it's subtitled Learning from Mistakes, the Value of Failure, and What's Right About Being Wrong. And I'm particularly glad because it's a topic I have so much personal experience on. Many, many of you may have left the house tonight and been told, well, why do you need to learn any more about that? <laughs> Actually, I, did, I wanted to begin with a personal story. Um, when my daughter was in first grade, she's now 12, so don't tell her I talked about her. <laughs> Carrie is best. So, um, I had my first conference with her amazing teacher, this first grade teacher who had taught first grade for like 30 years and was still full of energy. And the teacher told me that my daughter had a perfection problem. And, you know, I have this really ugly parental confession, which is that my first reaction was, perfection is a problem? You know, like I had grown up this sort of chubby, frizzy, you know, nose-picking little kid who fought with her brother all the time. And my daughter was like blonde and thin and harmonious with her brother and she, you know, did great and everything. And so I, I didn't understand how it was a problem because I actually thought she had a shot at it. <laughs> you know, I thought she could aspire to it. And so the teacher for devotion parents, this was Nancy Frame, she, um, so she, I, she explained to me and she said that when a child has a need to be perfect, it means that they're not willing to try challenging things at which they won't be perfect. They're not willing to take a big chance. They take these smaller steps because they don't know the outcome and they're not willing to risk it not being just right. So that means they're gonna be having anxiety about trying out ideas. If you feel like you have to be right and perfect all the time, you might not offer up half-baked ideas because other people might disagree. But in fact, this teacher said, you know, half-baked theories move the conversation forward. And if you're doing something like, say, a science conversation, and you say, well, maybe, you know, it might be this, and it's a wacko idea, but it can be the most interesting part of the conversation. So it also becomes a problem for the class because the conversation can stall and the ideas won't be as interesting. And it's definitely a challenge for the child because they're not taking the risks they're capable of taking. And so their progress will actually not be as rapid as it would be otherwise. And also they may not be expressing their most creative ideas. So I spoke with her this week to sort of refresh my memory and I asked her, well, what do you do about that? And she said, well, you consciously develop a culture where making mistakes is seen as an essential part of learning. And you take mistakes when people make them and you try to talk about how valuable they are. And she said, I'm very clear with the kids. If you're not making mistakes, you're not challenging yourself enough. And if what you're doing is always correct, you're not doing things that are hard enough for you. So you basically get across the message that you really value mistakes. Not a mistake like two plus two is five, but you know any others that could be, could show interesting thinking. 
And also this teacher would talk about her mistakes because she said, we're a learning community. So my response was, yeah, sure, when you're in first grade and you've got those cute little toilets right off the bathroom and you have snack time, you can say it's great to make mistakes, but just try that with high school kids who have the whole weight of their future on their shoulders. And she said, I know high school teachers who think a lot about this, too. So I'm really eager to hear even the high school experts, actually, talk about these issues tonight. And I'm particularly eager because I feel like this theme of imperfection kind of mixes in with this whole disturbing bunch of headlines that we've been seeing lately. I don't know if I'm just paying more attention or if there are actually more of them, but everything from this New Yorker piece about the SATs and how grueling and useless they are, and then questions about whether toxic school culture are driving kids to desperate acts. And there was a piece on WBUR just yesterday headlined, The Dark Side of Getting Into College. And there was a great Globe piece just this week by Beth Titel, who is also a Brookline mom, about this sort of high school summer arms race. Did anybody see that? Where it's like, you, you, can't, you can't just rely on you, Your parents are going to be pushing you to do things that look good on your resume. So, and you know, at the same time, NPR is reporting that student debt has now topped a trillion dollars, and that even though college has become more and more unaffordable, college has become more and more important for the whole course of your economic and work life. So these are really hard issues, and I can't wait to hear what, what you say on them and, and working the imperfection theme into them. So I was talking to a friend this morning, and she knew about this panel, and she said, well, you know, everyone will be saying, yeah, 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 but they're still going to want to send their kid to Harvard. Yeah. And I think for me, that's the suspense for this discussion, is how do you thread that needle? So, um, in particular, there, you may have seen the questions that were put out beforehand. The kinds of questions that our panelists will be looking at will be things like, do mistakes, failures, losses, moments of uncertainty and blunders have benefits? How do we effectively identify and promote these benefits? When and how are mistakes useful? How does fear of making mistakes impede learning? How do we help children learn to move on after a mistake in a way that promotes growth and other benefits? When is it okay or even useful to say, I don't know, ever? So our format for tonight is going to be that each of our panelists will have a seven minute kind of an opening statement and I will be the brutal timekeeper. And when your time is up, you will hear the dreaded marimba. <laughs> on my iPhone. Um, so seven minutes for each, and then we'll just have questions so you can, you can start to formulate them. Um, you can see the biographies in your programs if you have them. And speaking first will be Karen Brennan, who's an assistant professor of education at Harvard University in the Graduate School of Education. Karen. Do you want to, you can, yeah, actually, come up. No, it's good. That's fine. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love the picture. Okay. Okay. So. Let me share. My pictures. So thank you so much for the invitation to join you this evening. It's really thrilling to be here. This is a topic that's near and dear to my heart because I love thinking about getting stuck and then hopefully at some point getting unstuck. And so that's how I was going to use, use my seven minutes. So this is a photo of me working with a teacher. For the past seven years, my research activities have been focused on helping teachers Think about how to work with the scratch programming language in K-12 classrooms primarily. So with Scratch, you build interactive media by snapping blocks of instructions together, just as you build things in the physical world by snapping Lego bricks together. That's sort of the, the metaphor for the digital world. And you can build with Scratch all sorts of projects. You can build stories, games, animations, and simulations. This is a sort of a, a sampling platter of types of projects. So in the upper corner, we've got a digital piano. In the bottom corner, we've got an air traffic control simulation. In the upper right corner, we've got an interactive book report about Beowulf made by an eighth grader. And I've been working with a wide range of teachers, K to 12, college and beyond, across curricular areas. Teachers who know a lot about computers and computer science. Teachers who don't know all that much. Some teachers who are terrified of computers. And I've learned a lot about teachers' concerns about working with Scratch over the past seven years. And probably the biggest concern is that they're going to have students work on a big self-directed project, and the student is going to run into this sort of like crazy, seemingly intractable problem, 
and the teacher isn't going to know what to do. And so again and again, I hear from teachers, I'm afraid of getting stuck. What if I can't help? What if I fail? What if I can't help the students? What if I can't solve their problem? And my response is, okay, fair enough. <laughs> that sounds kind of scary. It's intimidating to start from this blank canvas, so this is a scratch off an environment, and to build up a project you love. Imagine being told you can do whatever you want. Where do you even begin? The Scratch Offering environment is accompanied by an online community where people are sharing their work. And these kids in and out of school have created and shared more than 5 million projects since Scratch was launched in 2007. So I'm wondering, looking at the community, well, how do kids out of school who don't necessarily have the benefit of teacher support deal with Scratch? How do they figure it out? So I've spent several years studying and interviewing kids in the online community, and there tend to be sort of three clusters of kids. One group of kids <laughs> encountered Scratch, didn't really know what it was, didn't really know what they wanted to do with it, didn't really have any support. I call that the meh group. They sort of left Scratch behind. The middle group, you've got another group of kids that are really excited about it. They know what they can do with it. They have a lot of support, maybe from parents, maybe from other family members, maybe informal learning environments, they figure it out. And then this third group of kids, they don't really know what Scratch is, they don't really have any support at home, but they really are just determined to figure it out. So I became really preoccupied with kids in this third group, and so I asked them, well, how do you get unstuck? And what advice do you have for teachers who are afraid of getting stuck? So I thought I'd share with you their top five strategies for getting unstuck. <laughs> Strategy number one, read through your code. This probably seems pretty evident if you write an essay, for example, and you're trying to figure out does it make sense, you read through it, but a shocking number of kids would throw out their whole project uh, if they ran into any sort of challenge or problem with, the, the pro with their project. And you can imagine, imagine you wrote a whole big essay and there was a typo and you decided to throw the whole thing out because it's just like a disconnect there. And so over time, kids realized that maybe reading through their projects was a better strategy. Strategy number two, experiment with your code. If you can't find the problem by reading through your code, just try tinkering with the code. Uh, one kid compared the process to playing the game Banana Graph. I don't know how many people yeah. yeah, people know this. So just take out blocks of code, put some in, reorder it, mix it up. I thought this was also a good strategy. Strategy number three, look for examples. As I mentioned, kids have access to more than five million projects that can serve as sources of inspiration or as examples. If you want to make a project that involves side-scrolling, well, find a sample project, find another one, find another one, compare the implementations, learn from other people's work. Strategy number four, work with someone else. From collaborating to consulting, kids talk extensively about the value of working with others. Last but certainly not least, strategy number five, be persistent. All of the kids I interviewed talked about the great challenge, but enormous satisfaction one derives, one can derive from programming. But they acknowledge that sometimes you need to know when to take a break. <laughs> and I thought this was so beautifully expressed.
The question to ask about the program is not whether it is right or wrong, but if it is fixable. If this way of looking at intellectual products were generalized to how the larger culture thinks about knowledge and its acquisition, we all might be less intimidated by our fears of being wrong. So, my argument is that we shouldn't avoid struggling, we shouldn't avoid not knowing, we shouldn't avoid failing. This struggling, this not knowing, this failing, that's the starting place. It's the marimba for learning. <laughs> and we should be embracing these things, finding ways to create more of these opportunities and that's what I think about when I think about getting stuck. Thank you. And next to speak is Carlo Rotella. Again, you can see his uh, bio in the in the leaflet you've got. And he's a director of direct, is director of American <laughs> Studies and a professor of English at Boston College and the Brooklyn. So uh, my kids are in middle school, and I teach college students and grad students, so I'm sort of bracketing the high school moment. Um, <laughs> too early. Uh, so um, you're going to hear from all of us, I think, one way or another, this idea, uh, the idea that imperfection and failure are built into the process of doing things well. Right? And so my version of that, I'm an English professor and, and writer by trade, and my version of that is that um, the, the imperfection and failure are, in fact, the objectives of my writing process, and I'll explain what I mean. So imperfection in the sense that my mission, you know, my worst moment is the blank screen, the blank page, right? And my entire objective is to write something bad so I can make it better, right? So good, good writing is all in the revision anyway. <coughs> So my, the product I want to produce in a draft is something imperfect. That's what I'm after. If I was shooting for anything else, I would not write anything at all. So it's not like perfection makes you a better person, a more beautiful person, not at all. Right? What I'm saying is that imperfection is the objective. Right? And the other thing that's built into my writing process is failure. That I start writing before I'm ready, before I finish my research, before I know what I'm saying, so that I will fail. And so that when I fail, I will say, I need to write three paragraphs right here about the film industry in New York in the 1970s, and I know nothing about that. Right? So I can't write these paragraphs, and I have now just generated a piece of my research agenda that I can go deal with. Right? So that it's not like imperfection and failure make you a better person. It's that, that they are the process of writing. Right? They are the process of making work, making work at all, and then making it better. Right? Um, and that also, uh, is true in the classroom, that, that um, uh, there, the, the, the fear of, the, the worry of having ever said anything wrong in the classroom tends to be very paralyzing. And the thing I'd say about that is that um, there's a kind of useful comment that you hear a lot in an English classroom where a student who's done the reading and prepared says the thing that is correct, right? And that's, that has merit and it's worthy. But what we're doing is, we're forming a community of inquiry and we're trying to produce an analysis. And so there are things that people can say in the classroom that are actually in many ways more valuable and that I regard as more advanced that actually look like imperfection and failure, such as um, the student who says, um, I've been listening to what we've been saying and we're getting pretty comfortable with this analysis, but here are these other parts of the novel that don't fit, right? So in other words, let's fail. Let's fail to produce this analysis and maybe we'll produce a better one, but it's not like, and, and here I have it hidden behind my back, right? It's rather, I think we're failing, but we're failing in a useful way, and here's some more pattern for us to recognize and do something with. Um, and also that, the, the, the kind of comment that is itself in perfection, which is the comment that begins, I don't know what to do with this scene, or this character, or this aspect of the novel, right? It's sort of, I don't know what to do with this, but Here's a start on it, and I think it leads me in this direction, but what it really does is undoes this thing that we're all getting a little too cozy with, this analysis we're all getting a little too cozy with. And again, in the process of producing an analysis in the classroom, imperfection and failure are essential parts of the process, and are in fact, if you're, if you're purely sitting there thinking, how's this gonna help me get my kids into a better college, or you're a kid thinking, how am I gonna get a better college, 
In a lot of ways, it's more advanced. In a lot of ways, it's more analytically advanced to say, like, we're getting a little cozy with the right answer. Let's undo the right answer and look for another answer. Um, that's all a, a quick preface to what I wanted to just sort of get on the table um, for maybe discussion later, which is the thing I'm not going to say even once, kids today, right? <laughs> there's nothing I can say that would be a good sentence that comes with it. Um, but I will say this, and maybe this is parents or teachers today more, um, is that we've gotten really good at a model of learning that I would call the toolkit model, right? Which goes like this. A kid needs to learn something, an adult authority figure, gives that kid a basic tool, analytical approach, that this works for sports, or for school, for ballet, for karate, for, you know, for violin. Kid, uh, uh, adult authority figure gives the kid the basic tool, the kid uses the basic tool, the adult authority figure, once it's used properly, the adult then um, uh, positively reinforces it. You did a great job, you did exactly right, that was great. It gives them a slightly more advanced tool, the kid uses the advanced tool, that was great, keep going. And so on until you build up a toolkit of fairly advanced, sophisticated work. That's how we do most things these days, right? And it works incredibly well. I'm not going to knock it, right? Positive reinforcement really, really works. But what that process does, and that is really the process that we use for the things that are labeled as important, school, extracurriculars that you pay for, right? So but what that does is it tends to defer or push out of the process imperfection and failure, as opposed to what I would regard as the great corrective to that, which is floundering, right? So if you're you know, 17 years old, you're studying really hard, you're, doing, you're filling your toolkit, and all these adult authority figures are filling your toolkit for you, but you start a band with your friends, and you all just know three chords, right? And you suck, right? <laughs> uh, and then you like, get a gig somehow, you know? Uh, and it's like it's in somebody's basement, you know? And uh, the way to get good at your instrument fastest is to do that, right? Is to get in a band with other people. And ideally, right, you combine the two. Okay, you get some instruction, but you do some floundering. And the thing that I found on the college level, right, is that um, there's no question that the kids who come into my classes are like professional college getter enters and fabulous, <laughs> fabulous students. I'm not gonna knock it again. But not so good at floundering. And the reason is the toolkit model has been so perfected, right? that it is now the expectation. And so one of the things that I have to build in is a certain amount of purposeful floundering. A certain amount, and the best way to flounder, as, as uh, you were just saying, is in company, right? With other people who are floundering, right? And sort of principled, purposeful floundering, right? And, uh, and the thing, here's, the, here's the, the punchline, right? Is that when you get to graduate school, floundering is in fact the dominant mode, and it's the thing you need to do, right? And the thing we say, my colleagues and I say, is like, Oh yeah, he's, he's good, but yeah, he's just an A student, right? He, you know, they're a dime a dozen, not really. But, uh, but what we're looking for is somebody who's gonna get it wrong in a spectacular and interesting way that will lead to something interesting, right? That will, that, somebody who's ready to flounder and equipped to flounder and prepared um, and ready to try things that are imperfect and that fail and, and keep trying, right, to iterate. So. And so one of the things to think about, I think, is that the, the, the uber success of the toolkit model has produced a situation in which, as parents, we need to actually look for creative opportunities to have our kids flounder purposefully. Uh, I think that was my marimba. Yeah. <laughs> flounder purposefully. <laughs> That's now under my vocabulary. Thank you. And next up is Leah Hager Cohen. She has written five books of nonfiction, including Train Go Sorry and I Don't Know, in praise of admitting ignorance, except when you shouldn't. <laughs> and I should mention that books by both Leah and Carlo are for sale outside, being sold by Dana Brigham, who runs the Booksmith, and so we all have to praise her whenever possible, <laughs> running that institution. Leah, thank you. I do an exercise with my creative writing students called Paper Bag. I hand every student a paper bag and I ask them to reach into the bag. Don't look inside, just reach in with your non-dominant hand and, and feel the object that's in there. And with your dominant hand, your writing hand, pick up your, your pen and pencil. And I ask them to trace really, really slowly the object that's in the bag. And I kind of ask them, so 
simultaneously to draw what they're feeling. But I say, but don't really think about drawing it. Don't try to take control of making a representational image. Just let your drawing hand kind of trace along with your tracing hand. And I say, some of you, upon touching the object in your paper bag, you might instantly get your brain going, I know what that is. It's a paper clip, or it's a button, or it's a Q-tip, or whatever object I've put in the bag. And I ask them to invite their brain to chill and not interject um, vocabulary <coughs> words or preconceived notions about the object they're feeling. I ask them really to slow down their tracing finger and try to experience the object without prior knowledge. Um, and, and I say, and if you don't know what that thing is in there that you're feeling, great, just, just feel its contours, trace its contours, see how closely you can observe without sight and without words. Because as I said, it's a creative writing class, but one thing I'd like to do at the beginning is unhook the writer's task of close observation from the other writer's task of making something out of words. And then, and we go through a couple iterations of this, and they pass bags around, and they feel different objects, and eventually they get to see what was in the bags. And eventually we move into exercises where, where they are using words um, to render what they have closely observed. And it's just, it's a different experience, a different kind of um, um, scale of observation and modality of observation. And this, this past semester when I did this with students, um, I asked them, I sort of tacked on another part of the exercise. I asked them to write a reflection only focusing on what they felt as they went through the various um, steps of the exercise. And so I thought I would share with you some of their responses. My index finger entered the paper bag afraid of what it did not know. I felt a little uncomfortable thinking that maybe an obvious household item could be this unfamiliar to my hand. What if I pulled out an obvious object and guessed it wrong? Do you remember my instructions to the students? To please don't even engage the part of your brain that wants to figure out what the object is. Please just release all that and focus on the experience of close observation through this tactile, um, this tactile sense. My fear was confirmed, an object so thin and ordinary in shape that identifying it would be an impossibility without further discerning characteristics. Do you also hear the, the, the language that, you know, I'm a college student <laughs> without further discerning characteristics? And, and then I sense perhaps some fear or anxiety in the diction, in the word shape. I searched frantically for the information <laughs> of the object in the bag. Oh, like, hello, for the young listening. Chasing it with one finger and then another, and then grabbing it with my whole hand. Later, when we revealed our objects, I was shocked to see that my first was indeed a bone. A similar feeling of relief <laughs> and pride. So I sort of, you know, my, my brain extrapolates that, that what they might have felt, were it not relief and pride, would have been, you know, um, disappointment and shame, maybe, um, fell over me as I pulled out the miniature candlestick from my second paper bag. I found myself relying, okay, so here we shift into a different kind of observation. I found myself relying on my previous knowledge of what a harmonica resembles instead of trusting my touch. How eloquently this student is observing her own process and, the, and <coughs> relying on knowledge, right? And knowledge which we generally are taught to esteem, if not revere. Instead of trusting my touch, please, my touch, you bring your touch into a college classroom. You know, isn't that something that we're 
just, you know, maybe is just above emotions. Please leave those at the door too, right? My dominant hand unconsciously began drawing what my mind knew to be the shape of a harmonica. I struggled to let what I knew be and to let my hand simply draw. Interesting, interesting. I am paying less attention to what the spool at hand feels like and paying more attention to what I already know exists. My knowing shuts doors of my perception. It creates a roadmap of the object and prevents me from exploring. So I was, I, my feelings, I think that's the last one, yes. My feelings as I read through the students' reflections were a mixture of ache, ache for them and what they were feeling, gratitude that they were willing to um, expose themselves and be that vulnerable, first to themselves and then to me, because they knew they were handing these reflections in. Um, and then further gratitude for their perceptiveness um, and their, 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 how articulate they were in creating a space for us to begin to have these kinds of discussions in the classroom. And I, you know, I think of the word imperfection, and I have an emotional response to that word. And I think of the word perfection, another emotional response. And I, I, don't, I, I don't so much want to say what they are as to invite you to experience for yourselves um, what, what goes on with you at an emotional level when you hear those words. <laughs> Thank you very much, Leah. Um, so before we get to questions from the audience, I'd like to call your attention to the survey that you can see some of the results from in this pamphlet. And I, I'm arrogating to myself the right to ask one question of the panelists to start us off. I would um, read to you one of the top comments that a student made. Mistakes cost points and lower grades. It would be a lot less pressure if there were chances to make mistakes without hurting grades. And, and I would put to you panelists as your, as your first question that what you're talking about, like having the, the time and space to get unstuck or being able to flounder purposefully or being able to feel your feelings without having to turn them into something academic, that those are all luxuries that many students feel like they cannot afford in this environment. How would you want to respond to that? Um, Leah, do you want to start? Sure. Shall I, shall I use this? Yes. Is this yeah. good for you guys? Um, I hate grades. I think grades are stupid. <laughs> I, I went to an undergraduate school and graduate school that they, they, there were no grades. Um, Hampshire College, <laughs> for those yeah. of you who are interested. And, um, <laughs> and, and then um, it was all past fail in graduate school. And I worked harder for those non-grades um, than I ever did in high school when I was getting grades. So one thing I do is level with my students about that and then acknowledge that we are in an institution, we call it like to be an institution that does assign grades. Um, and one thing I tell them is that I would like to unhook my judge role from my coach role as much as possible. And that for most of this, you know, I would step into that judge role on an as-needed basis when, when the system that we were in required me to assign grades. But most of the good work that we would do in our relationship together would come out of the, the, coach, um, the coach role. Um, so I give a lot of ungraded assignments on which I give copious feedback. We're in constant dialogue about how can, how can you push yourself further? Where is there room to grow? What might you try out here? But where many of the risks involved um, don't bear any cost in terms of degree. Thank you, Leah. Carly? Uh -huh. uh, I guess what I would say is that um, so I'm, I, I hate grades less than you do. I, I don't particularly like them, but they're there. They're sort of like money. You know. uh, so so uh, I mean, it's like it's sort of 
It's how we, it's one way that we measure things, right? Um, but I think the way I would look at it is that's essentially a curriculum problem, right? Is that, so for instance, I don't ever give any midterms in my classes. And what I say to students is we have a midterm every time the class meets, right? Which is that some huge percentage of your grade is what we do together as a community of inquiry, the kind of analysis that we do in class. And built into that is the expectation that you will take risks and make mistakes and correct those mistakes or not correct those mistakes or realize those mistakes are actually brilliant or whatever it is. So it's really, that's my, that's my problem. It's my problem to set up a situation in which um, risks are rewarded and mistakes are, you know, mistakes that are learned from are not penalized. Um, and one way to do that, at least in the, in the humanities, is the test is not a particularly good model for what I do, other things are. The paper, the revision of the paper, the revision of the revision, the take home final rather than the final in class. And also, really importantly, what happens in the classroom counts, not in a sort of show up and say the right thing way, but in a, when I look back over the semester, what did you contribute to the analytical work we did together in this room, right? And what you're paying your eight zillion dollars a year for is essentially two things the admissions process that produced the other students in the room, and the hiring and promotion process that produced me. And that's it. You can do the rest online at home, right? So more and more, I don't lecture. I almost never lecture anymore. And more and more, I try to make it as much about the community of inquiry and the analysis as possible, which means that I can build into the process um, things like, you know, did the student take chances, and, and make it clear from the beginning. So it's understood that even if what you're doing is grubbing good grades, you may cynically decide to take some chances, because it'll help. <laughs> okay. So, I, I don't know if I can express more beautifully than how Leah expressed it. I, I, too, hate grades. And I think part of it was just from my ex own experiences growing up. I was very, I became very aware of when I entered into graduate studies how much my self-concept relied on a notion of grade and that was just taken away from me and so I, I wrestled with that myself for many years and then seeing how my colleagues at MIT also wrestled with that when I finally went to Harvard I was just like no starting with grades as the end point of performance really didn't resonate with me you know it prevents people from taking risks I think it really prevents people from sort of dreaming big and enormously and, and working together like I love the framing of community which also so I, I don't offer grades, and that makes people feel uncomfortable because it's situated in this deeply, uh, in, in a much larger cultural conversation. So it's, a, it's nice to, to find much money. Your kindred spirit. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Great, so I'd like to open up the floor now to questions. I, I am just this very merciless timer, so please try to keep your question to one minute or no longer, and the answer is also, I'll, I'll keep down to two minutes or so, which should be fine. Um, anybody want to start? Ricky. Um, I have a question about how you grade your papers, because in high school the papers are graded with a rubric that seems so the opposite of being able to take risks or um, down to whether five points for spelling errors, 10 points if you have the thesis right, I wondered how you how you compare papers in, in a college setting without using a rubric. Are you asking me? Yeah. Um, so I teach two, two different kinds of courses. I teach creative writing courses and I teach critical courses in English and American studies. And it's a little different for the two, right? But in both cases, I think that you can do is you can start from, so it's a little different with college because you can assume, you can assume all that stuff. Right, the, the sort of mechanical stuff. And you can just give it back to the student and say, bring this up to speed and then I'll grade it. Right? So instead of giving it a bad grade, I can just say, like, here, do college level work now. Right, right. That's a little, you can't really do that as much in high school. Um, but I, 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 think that, uh, I think that one of the ways to build it in is, is to build rewrite into, the, into it. So that it's like, well, where did this start? What's the analytical intent here? Um, how is the content of the paper improving? And how's the form of the paper improving over time? So not just, Spelling, etc., but also structure, um, the chain of assertions, and all that kind of thing. Um, and we've got all semester, so there's no reason to make it kind of one and done, 
right? It's like, well, where did this argument start? Where did it go? I'm really in favor of the version where you write the short paper to try out the idea before you do it in the longer version, you know, and, and so that you've, you've wrestled with that idea a bit. But again, I think that a lot of that stuff is, is you know, building it in the mechanics of the assignment. And the main thing for me is build rewrite in the mechanics of the assignment. Not, you can rewrite it to get a better grade, but it doesn't get a grade the first time, right? And it's like, okay, let's see where we're at. And then let's see, what does it want to do? What do these ideas want to do? Okay, let's help it get there. Thank you, Carl. Leah or Karen, anybody want to add anything? Leah? Um, I, I sympathize so much with your question. I have kids in high school as well, and I, I'm frustrated on their behalf. Um, I, Sometimes it's a little bit helpful for me to think of the, the very schematic writing and rubrics, um, writing assignments and rubrics that they need to follow a little bit like etudes, you know, so if you're practicing the piano, if you're learning an instrument or, or learning any kind of a discipline, sometimes there are these exercises, these brief um, studies that, that you go through, you know, scales or, um, you know, simple tunes that you practice in order later to be able to, um, to play your instrument with greater freedom and greater expression. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know that that's helpful for the student who's in the position of having to subject him or herself to, to, these, um, to these standards um, or, or, or to these requirements. I guess I, I could see how mastering <coughs> certain certain of these basic mechanical skills could then become portable, you know, so that later on when there is room to, to be more fully expressive and to break from the original simple form, um, that, that they might be, their muscles will be strong from having practiced um, those, those early, more boring drills. <laughs> Thank you. Karen, do you want to add anything? Great. Other questions in the audience? Um, while you're thinking, please think of someone. <laughs> I will, um, I'll throw one at you now. So what, what wisdom could you offer about, you've sort of been talking as, as teachers, but now more towards a parental orientation of what, can, what wisdom can you offer about how to teach kids to accept their own imperfections and their own failures in moving past them? Um, Carla, you have a parenting book. <laughs> Take that first. But to be clear on that, I was okay. the writer on a parenting book. <laughs> several, two parenting books, and my, my writing partner was the child psychologist, so I was the guy in charge of saying you, probably. Because I did my etudes, and I'm, I'm a better speller than you. Um, so I, I find myself, we were talking about this a little bit before, that I find myself in the position of, of um, trying to talk my, especially my older daughter, down from the level of pressure that she's putting on herself. Like, I'm the one who's trying to get her to go to bed, and she wants to stay up and do her homework, right? Um, and I, I think a, a lot of, I mean, the other thing that's really powerful, positive reinforcement is one really powerful thing, and the other is modeling, right? So I try to model as much as possible floundering and, and you know, and, and imperfection. And it's like, well, I'm trying this new thing, and it's, it's, really, it's really hard, and it, you know, it didn't work the first time, and it's right the second time. Um, and, and to remember not to, I mean, I'm a deep, deep believer in hard work being much more important than anything else. But one of the things that I have to remind myself to do is not to just um, make hard work this kind of god of the household. That it's like, well, hard work means like your butt's in the seat longer than anybody else and you refuse to be, you know, um, you refuse to stop, right? And it's, that's a, one of the things I really work with a lot to the extent that I work with my kids on their school stuff, which is not so much, is, um, is uh, to get things done quickly and efficiently. Um, and not to just, you know, this thing was like, well, I spent five hours on my homework. I spent six hours on my homework, so I'm that much more virtuous than you are, right? And to really, I'm in seventh grade, right? I'm thinking an hour tops, right? And my daughter's like, no, I was going to take all night, right? And, and so one of the things I'm pushing is like, look, if you want to work hard, then let's at least work a little on working efficiently so that you don't fall into this trap of like, if I'm suffering, I'm virtuous, right? And if I'm up late, if I'm tired, if I have bags under my eyes, that means like I'm a good person, you know? Um, which is not coming from me, but definitely in her system, from getting from, from other students or from wherever she's getting it. Thank you. Leah, do you want to add anything? 
It's I like Carlo. I've been a little bit puzzled um, by by what seems to be a higher degree of um, worry um, in some of my kids than than I think that I have for them. Um, and, and so I, I, too, wonder a little bit about the culture, <laughs> you know, where is this coming from? If I don't think it's coming from me and pressure I'm putting on the kids, um, you know, so I think a lot about the pressure that their, their peers may be feeling, their peers' parents may be feeling, their teachers may be feeling, the administrators, the school board, the, you know, the, even the people who have to think about keeping taxes you know, keeping our tax base up, because so our schools have to be the good schools that you want to move to that. I think about the sort of chain of implications um, that may underlie some of the anxiety that may be producing um, a disproportionate degree of anxiety in some of our children. But then I come back to my own fear, <laughs> um, because the truth is I, I carry this fear too. Whether, I'm, whether it's being generated completely internally or I'm picking up on it um, in, the, in the airwaves. For me, a really, I don't know the answer, but a really important question to keep considering is how much of this is about fear and how much can I try to untangle what, what is this fear? And what, what conclusion do you come to? What is I, that fear? I, I, <laughs> I'm, I have no, I mean, I'm just, I return to the question, oh, sorry, I'm making this back up. I return to the question over and over. Um, it, ha it helps me, actually, even just to run through the exercise of noticing this is about fear. And even if I haven't sort of solved, you know, for, for what's causing that fear, I'm able to be alert to what's going on from a different place than the original place of just, you know, oh no, she didn't get a grade that made her happy, or you know, he hasn't turned that paper in and now his second quarter grade is going to be affected. Or, you know, from that sort of um, tight-shouldered, <laughs> um, you know, this shelf place, I get to come to it from a more broad, <laughs> loose-shouldered, um, deeper down questioning place. Karen, do you want to even get yeah, Take it, <laughs> if you'd like. And well, the, actually, Carlo's point about modeling really resonated with me, and I think that's sort of the biggest contribution that all adult figures in the lives of young people can make, is sort of being sort of open and honest and transparent about one's anxieties and the struggles that you face as a learner. I So I work at the Graduate School of Education, and so I, I work mostly with adult learners, and it's so striking to me that even in 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, how you put a person in the role of the student or the learner and all of these anxieties about performance and attainment and perfection get surfaced. And so when I meet the parents of a lot of the students at GSE, it's amazing the extent to which those conversations still don't happen. And it's like, oh, I want to make my mother happy, I want to make my husband or boy happy and proud of me. But always having those opportunities to say like, no, this is something I screwed up and it was a powerful and amazing learning opportunity or, you know, your my vision of you does not is not dependent on you getting an A at Harvard in these courses. And so I think sharing, having these conversations about thinking about thinking are incredibly important. I just wanted to add one little thing. Just to, I just want to be clear about this. It's not like I tell my kids when they leave the house, like just be a beautiful cat. Be good. <laughs> it's like I don't know, I want you to go and bring an honor to the family, right? But, I'm manifesting that way. But the way I want them to bring honor to the family is not just like do your best, you know. But rather, I want them to, you know, when they come back from school, I want them to feel like they used up whatever was inside of them and like they have to grow more overnight, right? And so what that means, that could in fact be, you know, like. Get a bit, you know, that they want to get a better grade on the test than they got last time, but it also could be something just like, you know, try something difficult, try something complicated, or, you know, look, you know, you're not getting along with that teacher and it's a problem. It's like, well, that's, that's what you've got to deal with this semester is figuring out a way to get along with that teacher or figuring out a way to, how, to find ancient Egypt interesting, right? <laughs> it's really important. It's a very important advanced educational skills to learn how to be interested in things. 
And that's not like getting 88 and going when you're 91. Thank you. Yes, question here. Oh, great, there are questions popping up. Here, then here, then here, then here. Okay, go ahead. Let me get this quick and perfect. I remember, I mean, I know how important uh, making mistakes. I know, it's like I think people in the back can't hear. Can oh, you like shout oh, it? making mistakes and, and you know imperfection is so important. It's part of the learning process. But I remember, like about 20 years ago, there was this whole battle between whole language and uh, fonts, and it was a big deal. And it seemed that the, the bulk of the educational uh, zeitgeist was in uh, whole language, and then they found social empathy. In fact, that learning your scale kind of thing. There's a book by Charlie Parker. Has to do with you know look, perfecting your instrument and then just play. But um, it seems to me that we're kind of going through this zeitgeist again with a, you know like about ten years ago with the testing and making students account not students but teachers accountable um, for how 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 they were doing. But I I can't help thinking that with your no grades and I remember uh, I had friends that went up to New Hampshire. But isn't there like some midpoint is, is, my, is, is my idea. I mean, it seems to me that grades been around a long time. We grade ourselves. And it seems if, if you knew you had a teacher because you're trying to do that wanted you to flounder, you flounder pretty good. You flounder. <laughs> so it seems like there must be some, it's good that we're talking. But it just seems like there's no, I, I don't think that we should teach children that they should just that there's a moment won't succeed and that they shouldn't do turn in a good first draft that maybe needs a rewrite. But, you know, I, 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 that's, that's, so, that's okay. So where's the goal? The medium you're where's asking? Like yeah. it sounds like they're yeah. maybe too extreme yeah. on the side of touchy feely. Yeah. Anybody? Defend yourself. So <laughs> I don't know if this is defense, but someone I've someone whose work I've been really inspired by. I wrote a book. Carla's like, you brought a prop. I did bring a prop. So Carol Dweck is a psychologist who wrote this beautiful book, I don't know if you know, Self Theory is Their Role in Motivation, Personality and Development. And she explores a series of tensions. Uh, one is how people view intelligence. And so is it fixed or is it malleable? Like, do you have some sort of finite quantity or is it something that can be grown in the ways in which people respond in different environments to that? And one of the tensions she talks about is performance goals versus learning goals. So like, are you entering into a task to like look good and look smart? Or are you entering in a task to sort of, sort of expand and grow within a space? And uh, when the, the problem, and I think this gets into this a little bit, we often get into this either or, right? Like, oh, do we have to be all about performance or do we all have to be about learning? And you kind of need both. I think where we need to really watch out is where, um, in the case of performance goals, where learning just gets completely subverted, that we become like, you get kids who are like sort of really good at going through the mechanics and like the motions of school, but like you're completely removing all of their interest and passion for learning. And so that's why I think we're in this cultural moment that's very performance driven. And so at least personally, I'm swinging really hard the other way. And I think we'll find some middle ground. We're just like so far in performance land that it, it feels super uncomfortable for me. It's fantastic. Uh, I, was, I was just going to say that so one thing I can do is to build in lots of different kinds of what I'm not going to call assessments. Lots of different kinds, in the course of the semester, lots of different ways in which they can show engagement with the ideas and the methods of the course and also command, right? So I do have to give them a grade, so I, de I do need to give them some opportunities to show command and not just engagement, right? And I think that's, that's really the most important thing is that there are things that they get formal grades for, and then there's a big chunk, which is sort of what kind of a citizen of the community of inquiry were you? And you have lots of opportunities to do that. And, but you're right, I need to give them enough opportunities to get a formal grade, because I need to turn in a grade to the registrar, and that's, that's part of the deal, right? Um, but one thing I'll give one concrete example. When I, turn in, when I give back the first paper marked up, I say, when you write the second paper, after you've written a draft of the second paper, read my comments on the first paper and read my line edit of your first paper, right? So what I would like to see is different mistakes the second time, right? <laughs> if you're doing the exact same thing again, apply my comments to the front on the first paper to the second one, and let's see if you, if you 
you've done the same thing again or something different. And that's a, a perfect it's a perfect example. It's like, are you engaging with your own mistakes and learning from them, or are you just, you know, getting the eraser and fixing them, right? Yeah. Leah, do you want to Yeah, just briefly, I like what you guys both said a lot. Um, I don't think assessment is unimportant. If anything, so that we can be assessing um, the educators, you know, I think that's that's probably the most. That's what I care about the most. Um, but I guess, but but the ways that we, you know, there are many different ways to assess. Um, and sort of along the lines of what Carlo was just saying, I in my classes, I assign a final portfolio, and many of the students are familiar with portfolio grading, and most of them are used to best works portfolio. And in my mind, a best works portfolio emphasizes displaying your most polished, shiny, perfect self um, so much that it seems to take energy from, I think, a more important um, a more important process to engage with, which is this metacognitive reflection um, where students are asked to, in, in my classes, to submit a process portfolio. And, and they're responsible for reflecting on some aspect of their journey, their journey, sorry, <laughs> you know, some aspect of, of their growth. And their process portfolios don't need to emphasize or even touch upon a narrative of success. Some of the most effective final portfolios I've had turned in are very clear-sighted, student being illuminated in the process of writing this narrative, reflections about struggles. Um, and sometimes the narrative is, I started here, I thought I was doing pretty well, then I hit a wall and realized I had all these problems. I tried to address those problems and I, and I landed on my butt. But, and, and so good, so that student engaged successfully and honestly and rawly with this metacognitive, um, reflection about his or her own work and sort of has then within him or herself I think a kindled desire about and here's what I'm going to do next um, along with a sense of ownership around here's what I am choosing to try next. Thank you. Okay, what was the question? Is there someone close to you? Oh, yeah. This, uh, Their response to the idea of perfection, rather than being, I need to work five hours on my homework and that will prove that I worked really hard, that they really have a distinct response of, it should just come to me. And if I'm smart, I just sit down and do it. So if I can't just sit down and do it, I'm going to go do something else because, you know, that that is the failure, is not having it come automatically. And so it leads to a lack of effort as opposed to um, really driving yourself really hard. Um, and you know, we've spent time since the kids were little trying to say, you know, it's really the, working at it and seeing yourself achieve something and that's the value and we flub all the time. But so I'm not sure where exactly they're getting that message from or how to um, effectively kind of counteract it. Um, but I think that that's the kind of the performance emphasis that I see is that they have this idea that they should just sit down and be able to do it. And if they can't, that's not someplace they're going to go. So are you asking where do you think this comes from and what can we do about it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good thoughts. <laughs> It seem like a crazy cult of Carol Dweck fan, but I wanted to just, I just wanted to read a little excerpt that I think speaks directly to this. So this is the beginning of chapter two. Of all the things that intrigued me when I began this work, none intrigued me more than this. Many of the most accomplished students shied away from challenge and fell apart in the face of setbacks. Many of the less skilled students seized challenges with relish and were energized by setbacks. How could this be? But the story got even stranger. 
Many very skilled students question or condemn their intelligence when they fail at a task. Many of the less skilled students never even remotely entertain such thoughts. So that idea that I, this has been echoed in several of the comments that, you know, you, if there's a risk of seeming stupid as a consequence of failing at something, you're not, why would you take the risk, you know? So I think whatever can be done to, like, how do you counter that messaging? And, it's, and it sounds like you're trying to do that. So it's like thinking, where are the other points? What are, where are the other sources of that messaging? And engaging in that, as Leah just mentioned, that sort of like that metacognitive task of like, what do you think that means for you? Where do you think you're getting those messages? Do you see a problem with that? Yeah, I don't know, it's, it's super tricky, but again, <laughs> I wish we were selling the carol outside. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I'd also to say that this is actually a place where the toolkit's really good, I think. Because what the toolkit would then say is break down the task into a doable, easier one. So take a little chunk out of that, succeed, positively reinforce it, succeed, positively reinforce it. In other words, I think the toolkit approach would be to say, maybe it's just too big a chunk of task. And that if you reduce it to something they can get right the first time, if that helps, if it's just even a little, even a ridiculously simple piece of it, then, I mean, this is, a, this is a place where that sort of positive reinforcement, I think, actually works, which is just like, well, maybe it's just too big a bite. You know, whatever, like, because my other daughter is exactly that way, like, it wasn't perfect, I'm out of here, right? And I think well, the way to do that, is besides modeling persistence, is to just get it down to a really small bite, and then positive reinforce that and move it up, and that toolkit's great for that, I think. Leah, you Good, great, next question here, yes. I just wanted to follow up on, on that because I think that's a really good point. One of the things I like to hear people think, one of the things I feel like at the risk of making gross generalizations in Brookline is that there's a huge um, disconnect in terms of the way children are challenged in elementary school and then when they move to high school. And I think there's a, a lot of, well, it's, it's really easy in elementary school for a lot of kids. And they, they get used to either, either I get it, but I get most of it, or I don't get it. And they, they don't have to work through a lot of things in elementary school and the same through middle school. So they don't get the skills for working through everything that you talked about in terms of persistence and trying to get different strategies. Most of what they get, either they get it or somebody gives them, you know, they're, they're fed the, the tool that gives them the answer. And um, then I think they get to the high school and it gets to get a lot more challenging. And some of them, so they don't have those tools of, you know, just ways of figuring things out that they are, they get stuck. Anybody want to address it? Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, that was irrelevant. <laughs> I, well, we'll take that as a statement rather than a question, I guess. Thank you. Well, I'll piggyback on that because my question was more about the cheating that may go on in the colleges, um, the college level as well as in the high school level, and the impact of just the fear of making those mistakes or the lack of time to flounder. Um, and what you may have seen in the trend that may have, may, may make people actually take a second look. Cheating. Carla? Um, I, I think of cheating as, uh, again, a, a, as my responsibility to create assignments that are, that are, you know, for instance, that there's nothing floating around online, that there's no paper floating around online that would satisfy an assignment. So that's part of it, right? Is to is to remove the possibility of that kind of cheating. And in, at least in my end of the humanities, that's the kind of cheating that matters, right? It's downloading a paper. Because, you know, you can go ahead and talk to all the other students about your paper as much as you want. That's not cheating, right? That's fine. Um, so, you know, again, I think that's that's a teacher's responsibility is, is to create assignments that are so specific to the course and, and, and so rooted in what we're doing together that um, that there's nothing floating around online. And so for instance, this is a concrete example. Um, in the assignment, use a quote that one of the students, quote one of the students what they said in class. That was sort of one of the more perceptive remarks that was made that really registered on the others. Build the assignment around that. Yeah, good luck finding a paper from a downloaded assignment. <laughs> um, and again, I just, I, I think that cheating is, 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 a, is, a, is an expression of all this pressure. It makes perfect sense why it would happen. But I think that there are structural moves you can make 
to um, to sort of mitigate the temptation to do it, or the or the, or the, the positive result of doing it. Um, you know, and, and and by the way, when I say structural pressure, pressure, I also mean the really really big structural pressure, which is like middle class is getting smaller. There's there's less pie to go around. College is harder to get into. They're under more pressure. I get that, right? Um, but one thing I can do is create assignments that are so course specific that I'm asking you to engage this course and not like whatever's out there in the paper sphere. Gary, yeah. I mean, you're kind of leaving out, so you're finding a structural solution without addressing the internal yeah. causes. <laughs> um, I don't think the internal causes are really available to me yeah. as a teacher, right? Um, and you know, and I, I mean, I, my kids too, I try and teach them to be honest and do the right thing, but I think part of it is that you know, what's your level of desperation um, going into this is at least a part of function of what's the level of your parents' desperation uh, for you going into this. And, and uh, you know, that again, I, I, as much as I think positive reinforcement works, I'm convinced by my child psychologist friends, this guy Alan Kasdan at Yale, that um, modeling is the most important thing that in terms of teaching tool that parent can use in terms of modeling. Am I desperate about this seventh grade test? No, I am not. <laughs> um, I, I need to make that clear. Like, yes, I want you to bring honor to your family by doing a good job on this test, but I don't need you to bring honor to your family by getting 100 at all costs, including cheating. Right? That would bring dishonor to your family. <laughs> that would be bad. Leah. Yeah. I mean, actually, the, the Harvard cheating scandal of a few years ago was, was sort of the, the kernel um, from which grew this, this little book that I wrote, I don't know. Um, so I, I mean, I did, I was very interested in um, why, in particular, why students who had already, in some ways, um, gotten in, you know, they were already in about the most elite institution in the world. You know, many of us perhaps might think, you guys should be exempt from being insecure. Um, you, like, you guys, of all people, you feel the need to cheat, you've already got it made, you know? And, and that piece of that story intrigued me. And then more recently, um, the student who called in the bomb scares um, and, and in order to get out of taking a test. You know, that, that story is fascinating because if he was a Harvard student, right? Or was this MIT, it was Harvard. So, Presumably, he had the mental capacity to understand that what he was doing very likely would incur a really high cost. And, and yet, apparently, the cost of taking this test and doing poorly on it, to him, felt greater. It's hard for me to even wrap my mind around the state of you know, his internal misery and fear um, and sense of powerlessness and despair that would have led him to do that. So I have no answers, but I, I come back, as I often do, to trying to wrap my mind around the, the larger questions here. And I don't, I don't know that I, you know, I, I don't have them all ready to articulate, but maybe that's part of the work of us in this learning community here tonight is to is to begin to get at some of the, the largest questions. Thank you. Um, Gil, Hi, yeah, um, Gil is in charge of the mic. Yeah, so good question. So, Gil. First of all, thank you very much. Um, my question actually relates uh, more to the developmental changes that are happening in kids as they go through high school into college. Um, some of the statements were made earlier about children when they're in elementary school they're typically being, there's more of a sage on the stage kind of mentality in school, and it's, it's shifting to the guide on the side uh, approach, which is great. As they uh, go into middle school and into high school and certainly into college, they're expected more to prepare for the next class in advance and not have it all come into them in advance. So they have to be thinking about it. And so that um, immediate adapting and understanding it on the fly is less common. So where I'm going with my question is, how does this relate both to multiple intelligences and, and, and being able to not so much evaluate, but really to value people who have extreme abilities in different areas other than just quantitative and analytical, um, and how that relates to kids with special needs, 
Um, are they valued more in college now because they can be some of those people who contribute as creative ideas who might not be always on the right answer per se, but could have a really interesting perspective? And will that actually bring some more of, a, of, of an equality or, or uh, a more of a sense of, of uh, value to each of the members of the classroom? Thank you. Maybe Karen, you're from the school of ed. Sorry, it's a hard question. <laughs> I, there's, there's, I feel like there's a lot to unpack in the question, so I'll take a stab at some part of it, but feel free to redirect or reframe. I think um, I, this is going to sound like a Debbie Downer sort of comment, but um, I feel like across the spectrum, K-12, college, beyond, I don't think we do as good a job as we might supporting the broad range of learners who come into our environment like looking across the whole spectrum. And I and I see this even in what happens at the ed school. I would I would think that like sort of the best teaching and learning takes place at the ed school, but still you have large class sizes, you you know how do you get into the minds and meet every learner where they're at? I think it's an enormous challenge. So I think really we are I liked your framing of stage on the stage and guide on the side. You know, like how do we constantly disrupt these like very stubborn notions we have about what it means to be a student, to be a teacher, to be a learner, to be a facilitator. I think, I guess my answer is sort of a non-answer to say that I think we still have an enormous amount of work to do. And a lot of that work needs to happen at schools of education and teacher professional development and the types of experience that pre-service and in-service teachers have. You know, I just, it's very, very stubborn, sort of old, old school way of thinking about teaching and learning. So I don't think we're in there yet, but I think there's sort of like promising indicators such as like communities of learners, community of practice that are, are promising, but still like ed schools, education has an enormous amount of institutional inertia that we're sort of combating. And don't standardized tests get in the way of that shift, yeah. actually. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot operating against us. Great time. Carla, do you want to add anything? Um, I'm, I'm going to take an even smaller piece out of that. Um, uh, I just went out of my mind, but remind me. Small piece. Yeah, small piece. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having the perfect moment. <laughs> we'll come back to you, but we'll come back. But when I think of it. So I, um, I work with adult leaders, and I'm really concerned that our children aren't gaining the mindset and skills to lead in the future. Um, the futures we've seen through the Arab Spring and such not, um, and what's happening out in the Ukraine, I mean, we're all moving, we all, not just those countries, but certainly here in the US as to the recession, we're moving into a world that is volatile, that's uncertain, that's ambiguous, and um, a bit chaotic. And I'm not sure the kids are learning um, in the academic environment the skills they're going to need to lead in the, the new normal, I guess. And so I'm looking to you to see where can they learn skills like rapid prototyping? Where can they learn skills like dilemma flipping? Where can they learn skills like rapid um, smart mob organizing? Things like that. I see that, I see them, I see my son, learning those through games, but I don't necessarily see him learning that across the spectrum in um, the school that he goes to here in Brooklyn. Thank you. Karen, I feel like that's too. Oh, okay, go ahead, Carla. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to do that to the broad range of questions, which I just remembered what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> it, it relates, I'm going to try and make it relate even a tiny bit to it. Um, so, um, which is to say that there's actually a lot of, and this is something I struggle with all the time because I do have to give grades to people. It's like, well, what am I, like, like, let's take two students who've got a B plus, and one really just stuck pretty, pretty um, closely to the shore of like what I said in class, and, and they wrote a paper that was kind of a variation on something that we did together in class, but did it really well. And then another student went out there, well out to sea, there were bigger flaws in, in what they did, but it was really, you know, went way out there and tried something, and it's like, well, so the, those are both reduced to this kind of almost opaque B plus, right? Because neither really fully um, showed complete command of the materials and ideas of the course. But that second one, I think, is much more what you're talking about, which is that somebody went way out there and tried something, you know? But especially over time, as I've gotten older, 
I'm a, I actually have learned to put a little more value on the one who just kind of did the careful thing and did a good job with it for the reason that you mentioned, it, which is, which is um, these are your compulsory figures, these are your scales that you're working on, so that you, when you do go out and do the, do the other one, you'll let you be a little more confident in it. But that's something I wrestle with all the time, is that there's a lot of ways to engage the ideas of a course that show command, and, and one of the big ones is some people just want to be way out there doing what they do, and some people just want to stay really close to me. Um, and I think that the way to say this, and I'm now in 41st grade, right? So that's <laughs> a long time, is that um, as you go up past high school and into college and then into graduate school, it starts looking a lot more like kindergarten, which is to get something spectacularly creatively wrong is rewarded again right when you get further up. And that it really is, you have to stop trying to lose your teachers and start just working with the material yourself as you get. So as we go along, hugging the shore, if we get into grad school, that's just not going to do it. You know, that's, that's competently hugging the shore is no longer possible. Whereas I think the question about high school is that competently hugging the shore is the safe way to play in high school. But the thing to bear in mind is as you go on, they're going to want you to be able to get out there and do that other stuff. And there's a point where, you know, they get the same grade, but the trajectories are totally different. Well, actually, the question about the first one is, are they ever going to get out there? And the question about the second one is, are they going to ever have the kind of mechanical confidence to get out there and do it well? Thank you, Carl. And that does seem like it hooks back into the question about how to be a citizen of this uncertain world, right? Like, Karen, if you're in, you're kind of a lifelong kindergarten kind of person, you just keep teaching yourself the skills that you need to do a smart model. We have time. So we were supposed to end at 8.30, but we did start 15 minutes late, so I think we could take a couple more questions, if that's okay, with 21st century fun people. <laughs> okay, so just a couple more. There's, like three. Yeah, there's still three more, maybe, all in that section. Hi. Um, so uh, 21st century skills and global competencies, I'm very interested in um, in those, and I see that you guys are all very good teachers that work in a performance-based culture, and uh, and also you ask students for their path to work, work, working towards uh, asking the students uh, to develop metacognitive skills, and also to uh, to make sure that we achieve those ben benchmarks. So I, I sometimes wonder if we're asking too much from them, and if they're ready to give us all that we ask from them global competencies, 21st century skills, to achieve the benchmarks, and also to develop metacognitive skills. Um, I always wonder um, how good teachers like you guys, what is the balance between teaching English, biology, chemistry, and all those metacognitive skills and all those 21st century uh, skills that, uh, that are implied in all the subjects too? Um, and how much does the curriculum help or does not help? and how much we can change it or not. That, and it's something that we're all struggling with, I'm sure, but I wonder what you guys think about, um, about the balance um, that the student should have. And... Anybody, maybe just one person so that we can get to the last question. <laughs> I mean, I think I'm hearing in your question um, a little bit about when, when as an educator, you're bound by a set curriculum, and you're also trying to incorporate all of these other components, you know, the, how do you teach students to be leaders, how do you teach students to um, develop their metacognitive skills, how do you teach students to attend to their own emotional response to the material as they're learning it that might perhaps allow them to say, okay, I didn't get this right away, and I'm registering my discomfort, and I'm willing to go, you know, all this stuff that's maybe sort of off the map, you know, off the, off the official curriculum, and it, it sounds like, as you said, too much. Mm -hmm. You asked the question, is it too much for the students? But I, I'm also hearing it as, is it too much to ask the teachers to engage the students on all of those levels? Um, and, and it sure does sound overwhelming. And I guess, I mean, what a cop-out answer, but I guess kind of like we all do every day, we, we do as much as we can. But I think sometimes just being mindful of, of all the stuff, the stuff that's spelled out and the stuff that, that didn't make it into the 
printed benchmarks, and also having those conversations with students so that, you know, I realize at different developmental ages it's possible to have that conversation in different ways, but so that students too are aware that there's all this other stuff going on that's not on the test, perhaps. Um, even just that little bit of widening of the view of what we're here to do and, and why it might be important, um, that seems to me like enough. Thank you. Okay, two, two. Uh, Bailey, yeah. Yeah, when, when I was younger, I was one of those A students, and now that I'm getting older, I find that uh, there's sometimes uh, a, a big difference between a desire to do well and doing something that you love, that they sometimes are in conflict with each other. I went to a school where I was surrounded by geniuses in math and physics, and that had a big impact on me because I felt I can't compete against those people even though I'm interested in this. And um, now that I'm older, I like to cross-country ski, but I'm terrible at it, but I love to do it. And so that feels like a little bit of wisdom, that I don't have to be great to do something that I love. And I think, to some extent, I don't know if you can talk about this, this, the fact that desire and performance are sometimes at odds, and that uh, sometimes the community of inquiry that you find yourself stuck in may not be good for your development of self. That it may be, perhaps, you're, you, you know, you might make a really good uh, uh, doctor, but you're with people who are so intimidating that, that you end up not going into the field. Are you referring in part to Brookline High School too? No, no, I just, I just, I just feel that we put so much emphasis on getting into the top schools, on getting A's, etc., that um, some, I think that what suffers is is a true deeper development of the self and figuring out who you really are. And there are a lot of us who who, who perform really well, but we go through life still trying to figure out who am I really? I know I can get A's. Thank you. And coming from any one of you. Yeah. I just, briefly, I think about something Carlo mentioned earlier, which is the, the honorable role of the amateur in our society. And if, it, if we could confer even a little more honor on the idea of amateurism, it might, it might um, sort of you know, buttress those searches for, for self and for doing what we love. Okay, one, yes, oh, Ricky, one last question. Maybe yes. this is the last question, and I want you to get back to these heart-wrenching comments from these kids. Yeah. Getting any little thing wrong in schoolwork can make me feel awful about myself. There isn't much room for mistakes at BHS. BHS I feel disapproved of and disappointed. And I want to know how our community can address this in a real, authentic way and admit our own mixed messages that we're sending to our kids and how this community can come together to try to address this so these kids aren't coming this way. I, I find this hard right now. Yes, I agree. Thank you. It's a great last question. And um, any, any thoughts from, from the panelists would be great. Karen, do you want to start with what Ellen I guess I less heard a, a question and more just like resonance about, yeah, this was really painful to read. And I think uh, I think there's just a lot of power in recognizing this as problematic. I think that's a good starting place. And I, I'm a big fan of learning communities more generally and not just thinking about like, is this a problem for teachers? Is this a problem for administrators? Is this just a problem that the kids need to work on their own? But like, how can the community come together and think about addressing, redressing, you know, the, what's going on here because this is this is intense intense material and i think it's best addressed by everyone as an ensemble thank you yeah and I, i'm not going to propose an answer either i mean I, I i think again that modeling is part of it is like what, what are the mixed messages that you're sending um, exactly um, and the other thing and this is probably not a popular point of view certainly not in my household if you ask my wife but um <laughs> You know, I think there's many more places, uh, there's more good colleges than there are high schools in this country. Um, and if you stop 
you know, if, if you just never bring the U.S. News and World Report yeah. fictional <laughs> ranking of colleges <laughs> home, <laughs> then it will be easier to say, okay, there's about a couple thousand choices here. Um, what are we looking for? What are we interested in? I had a very clear idea in my mind. I grew up on the south side of Chicago. I wanted to go at least a thousand miles away from home. <laughs> I wanted it to be on a hill in a small town where it was quiet and I could concentrate. But I had no idea whether that would, you know, I didn't, less information around back then. I was like, is that Gettysburg College? Is that Lafayette College? Is that Amherst? Is that Wesley? And I had no idea. I just had this picture, right? Um, and but there's something important in that. I was at a stage, developmental or otherwise, intellectual, where what I needed was some peace and quiet. Now, I have a feeling that that 18-year-old I was then, who, by the way, would not get in anywhere now, <laughs> certainly not at the, the, the university I teach in, right? Um, that's a club I would not be invited to join. Um, that 18-year-old that, that, um, that needed a particular set of things, but if that 18-year-old moved that 18-year-old to the present and said, well, this school's ranked 37, and the schools you're looking at are ranked in the 50s, that 18-year-old would have made a mistake and gone to the school that was ranked higher in this imaginary fictional meaningless uh, ranking. And, and, and I think that's part of it. Again, it's like, what are you modeling? You know, even if you're going to, let's just assume you're anxious. Like, what are you anxious about? And I'm not saying so you. The question is, what's the community yeah. modeling? Not us as yeah. Community. Yeah, but then that's interesting how that works, right? Because, right. The, we are part of the community, but it, it's both. So right? what I see is that I think my, my daughter's fellow students are really modeling the strongest anxiety. Um, and I actually feel myself in the role of correcting for it as much as possible. Um, because exactly for that reason, that it's, it's like she's coming home smoking, you know, like she's coming home like, well, everybody else is smoking at school, you know, but maybe smoking is not the best idea here. So, uh, and, and so I think a part of it is that, for instance, is that you are, high school is the most evaluative, it is the most kind of mechanical, it is the most numerical, it is the most win or lose, at least the way it's presented, and I think part of my job is going to be to say that, well, actually, what's coming on the other side of this is not winning or losing, but there are literally thousands of possibilities for this working out very well, right? And, and I think, if nothing else, just for a sanity check, I think that's a good idea. Thank you. I think you guys can, can keep on talking, actually, afterwards, but I just want to introduce Andrew Wise, who's the executive director of the 21st Century Fund, to wrap things up. So, meanwhile, across the hall, the concurrent session tonight, uh, perfection was canceled because nobody showed up. <laughs> so, so, thank you. This is really great. Um, Karen, first of all, thank you so much for, uh, for moderating. This is our third, our third event, a third big idea, and uh, Karen has moderated two of these. So, thank you very much. It's called you. Thank you so much. Um, also, uh, Ellen Brewster, uh, 
our chair of our overseers, and Elizabeth Zachos, our chair of our board, and somewhere is Galen Harrington, an English teacher extraordinaire, and also for program liaison uh, for the fund. Thank you so much. And mostly thank you for coming tonight, for caring, for participating, and making this night happen. So let's go home and, and, and tell our children to give everything they have, and then give them ice cream. Yeah. <laughs>